Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you that we can begin this week on this Palm Sunday and recall you riding triumphantly into Jerusalem as you rode towards your passion this week where you were tormented, where you suffered extreme anguish at the hands of the Romans and the Pharisees and all those who gathered around your cross. And tonight we just pray that as we begin this journey that in some measure we may again experience something of your passion. Speak into our hearts. Let us relive those moments, those hours through your torment. And come and just meet with us, Lord, and let us leave this place this evening just so mindful of the cross and everything that took you there and everything that it accomplished for us. And so, Lord, just come and in the stillness and even through this week, Lord, in the stillness, may we just get away from the busyness of our lives and just come and spend these moments with you just remembering, reflecting, pondering upon what you did for us at Calvary. And so draw near to us tonight. Minister into our hearts and lives. But most of all, fill our hearts with a vision of the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this evening is taken from the book of John's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get thee out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered the words that are written. Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it again in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. May God bless his word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who've joined us for the first time at one of our Holy Week services, just a reminder that at the end of the message each night we 
invite you just to spend some time quietly with the Lord, pondering upon God's Word, allowing God's Word just to continue to speak to you, maybe bringing a few prayers to God in response. And when you are ready to leave and you can stay as long as you wish, we invite you just to get up very quietly, to not speak to anybody, and once again just to please leave the sanctuary without a word and get into your car without a word and please just leave the property in a, in a moment and of, of silence and reflection. And I really just ask that through this week we just honor one another in that regard, that we just learn to be silent. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And with all the hustle and bustle around us, it's so important that we just honor that, that silence as we leave together this evening and each night. The Passover was one of the three main festivals where every Jewish male was expected to go up to Jerusalem. The other gospel writers record this event at the end of Jesus' ministry after his entry into Jerusalem. Whereas interestingly, John records it at the beginning of his ministry. John adds details that the others don't. The whip, the sheep, and oxen. And Jesus' words about the destruction of the temple. We read that there were many changes in the temple courts. They were there because, according to Jewish law, every male in Palestine over 18 years old was compelled to pay half a shekel temple tax to maintain the daily sacrificial system of the temple. In those days like today there were many currencies Tyre, Sidon, Rome, Greece, Egypt and each currency comprised of coins with differing amounts of silver and gold. The temple had adopted, adopted the Tyrian currency for temple dues. And so many changes were needed to exchange other currencies into this currency. The other reason for the many changes was that at the Passover, pilgrims from all over Palestine brought their sacrifices to the temple. Some came from very far and so would rather buy the sacrifice when they arrived than travel all the way with it. And understandably the best place to buy such sacrifices would be in the outer temple courts where both Gentiles and Jews mingled together for only Jews were permitted into the temple. At the Passover, the outer court became a hive of activity and iniquity. Unsuspecting pilgrims were being exploited, having to pay large sums of money for sacrifices, as well as paying excessive amounts for exchanging their money. And this meant that it was the poor among them who were affected the most. Another form of exploitation came in the form of the sacrifices being offered. Jewish law demanded that the sacrifice should be without spot or blemish. The same system was adopted as it is today when you take your car in for a roadworthy. Inspectors would be appointed to examine your sacrifice to see if it complied with the temple regulations. 
And like today, many of these inspectors were themselves corrupt. They were in partnership with those who sold sacrifices in the temple courts. They would reject perfectly good sacrifices so that their colleagues could sell more sacrifices and increase their profits. Seems like corruption is not a 21st century phenomenon. And it was for this reason that Jesus overturned their tables. For in Jesus' words, they had made his father's house a den of thieves. But let's examine this a little more. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record Jesus' teaching from Isaiah 56, verse 7, which says, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And yet it was the, the Pharisees who prevented any Gentiles from entering God's house. And yet God's house was supposed to be for all nations. Not only were the Gentiles barred from entering the temple, the outer court was the only place where any would-be Gentile worshipper could come and, and listen from a distance what was happening in the temple. For as I mentioned, they weren't allowed to go into the temple. And yet, this outer court had become a noisy, frenetic, and corrupt den of thieves. And so the Jews, in all their religious piety, had to all intents and purposes prevented those who were genuinely seeking for God from doing so. There was, however, a far greater concern. For the Jews believed that by simply preserving these outward symbols of religion through their, sim through their system of temple sacrifices, they could find favor with God. And yet they themselves failed in their universal mission to make God's house a place of prayer for all nations. John records Jesus rebuking them and demanding that they remove the sheep and the oxen. Isn't that tragic? Jesus was so distressed that he tells the Jews to discard the very offerings that were being presented to God by way of worship and sacrifice. Isaiah wrote about the same thing over a century before in Isaiah 11, from 11 to 17. The prophet too wrote about it in Hosea 5 verse 6 and 8 verse 13 where they spoke about paying lip service to God and bringing their worthless sacrifices when their hearts were not right with God. But are we any different today? What do we offer to God as a substitute for true spiritual worship? What songs do we sing to God that do not come from the passion of our hearts? Of our prayers are empty. How many of our hearts are thankless? John records that the disciples understood Jesus' actions, for they remembered that scripture that we saw in Psalm 69 Zeal for thy house will consume me. And in Psalm 69, it is the psalmist who laments his suffering as being the result of his zeal for God's house. 
And now centuries later, with the Messiah in their midst, he fulfills this prophecy. And the disciples recognize that those words were true of Jesus himself. That his zeal for his father's house would initiate the very path that he would tread to Calvary. But notice lastly, the question the Jews pose to Jesus in verse 18. And Jesus answers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Why is that significant? Simply this. His resurrection would be the ultimate sign of his authority for cleansing the temple. How so, you may ask? Because friends, by his death and resurrection, the narrow particular religion of the Jews would be replaced by the universal, all-inclusive gospel of Jesus Christ. The required repetitive animal sacrifices demanded by the law would be replaced by the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus himself. And this is precisely why John writes his gospel account with the end in mind. Precisely why John records this incident at the beginning of his ministry and not at the end. Not necessarily because it took place then, but because John wants you and me to see everything Jesus did from the perspective of him being the true Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Most writers write and bring their work to a fitting climax at the end. But not John. John begins with the climax. And everyone who reads John chapter 2 ought to be in no doubt as to why he did it. For Jesus came to replace the rituals of Judaism. Jesus, from the outset, came to be the Lamb of God, the supreme sacrifice for the sin of the world. There was no further need for any sacrifice to be brought to the temple, for the true sacrifice was among them. No wonder the disciple exclaimed when he saw Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen.